Tensions are rising tonight between Pakistan and Iran after an Iranian airstrike on Pakistani territory that killed two children. Islamabad has recalled its ambassador to Iran and it has expelled the Iranian ambassador. Now, this video from a local human rights organization is said to show the aftermath of the attack. According to Iranian state media, the airstrike targeted the headquarters of the militant group Jayush al-Adul. Iran has accused the group of carrying out terrorist attacks on Iranian soil. In the last few days, Iran has launched similar strikes against targets in Iraq and Syria. Here's Iran's foreign minister speaking today at the World Economic Forum about this attack against the group in Pakistan. This group, the so-called Jaish al-Ad, is an Iranian terrorist group. And they have taken shelter in some parts of the Baluchistan province of Pakistan. We have talked to officials in Pakistan and the security forces there several times. The group has carried out operations in Iran, once in a police station, where they killed our security personnel. Earlier, I spoke with Ali Fatola Nijad. He's director of the Center for Middle East and Global Order. He told me more about why this is all happening now. Well, the timing internally, uh, the regime is quite worried about uh, the uh, impending March double elections for the parliament in the Assembly of Experts, uh, where it fears the repetition of an historically low voter turnout. So I believe that the calculation behind these attacks is to provoke um, you know, smaller attacks directly against Iran, which the regime could uh, use for a rallying around the flag effect, which in my view will not happen because of the vast gulf that exists between state and society in Iran. And secondly, in terms of regional geopolitics, there is also a lot of dissatisfaction when it comes to uh, Iranian uh, responses to uh, Israel in uh, Israel's war in Gaza. So, um, uh, and in that, uh, you know, in this context, the Iranians want to show strength. They're able to lash out, uh, but they are not able to lashing out directly against the United States or Israel. So I believe those are really, uh, you know, strikes uh, to show strength, um, you know, regionally. Um, and those strikes are really uh, not uh, precise and uh, um, have led to a diplomatic and political fiasco, after all, for the Islamic Republic. Well, the United States has put Yemen's Houthi militants back on its list of terrorist organizations. It comes in the wake of numerous Houthi attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. The move slaps tough financial sanctions on the Iranian-backed group. The U.S. and the U.K. have struck Houthi targets in Yemen in a bid to stop attacks on vessels in the Red Sea. The Houthis have vowed to continue targeting ships until Israel stops its offensive in the Gaza Strip. The rebel group controls territory where most of Yemen's population lives. And with allies of both Israel and Hamas increasingly active in the Middle East, fears are growing that the bloodshed in Gaza could ignite a wider regional war. We have a look now at some of the latest developments in the region. What started with an unprecedented terror attack on October the 7th is quickly spilling out beyond the borders of Israel and Gaza, drawing in Israel's traditional ally, the United States, on the one side, and on the other, Hamas back or Iran. Recent days have seen dozens of attacks throughout the region. In Yemen, Iran-backed Houthi rebels are continuing their campaign to disrupt international shipping lanes. That despite dozens of airstrikes from the United States and others targeting Houthi military installations. In Iraq and Syria, Tehran attacked several sites, including one it claims was being used as an Israeli spy headquarters. Lebanon has also seen several Israeli airstrikes, which the Israel Defense Force says were targeting Hamas leaders in Hezbollah. Welcome to Davos. As world leaders gather in Davos for the World Economic Forum, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warned the world was on a path to an escalation of hostilities in the Middle East. All right, I want to bring in now Hans Jakob Schindler. He is with the Counter Extremism Project. He joins me tonight from New York. Mr. Schindler, it's good to see you. Let's talk about the possibility of optics here. I mean, do you agree with what we heard earlier 
that these attacks are attempts by Tehran to show Iranians that the country is an active player in the region, and they're doing this before double elections coming up in March? Well, certainly the, this is primarily for domestic consumptions, but I would also see that after this massive terror attack on the uh, commemoration of uh, Qasem Soleimani's uh, killing a couple of weeks ago, um, the Islamic Republic is under enormous pressure. This is a police state and the largest terror attack in the history of the Islamic Republic, there's never been more casualties than on that attack, really puts all of the security forces, embarrass them, first of all, and puts them under pressure to do something. And now what I see is that Iran lashes out. Really, none of the targets that Iran has struck have a clear connection to clear counterterrorism aims. It's more striking your usual suspects, Kurdish targets in Iraq, Kurdish targets in Syria, some godforsaken place inside Pakistan, for a group that hardly has any operations in the last couple of years, Jaish al-Adl, formerly known as Jund al-Ala, um, it really seems more a, a communication towards the inside that the state is still strong and the state can protect its citizens. So on the outside, these attacks really don't make a lot of sense, but for domestic consumers in Iran, this is going to show the average Iranian that the government has muscle where it counts. Is, is that the message? Yes. I mean, you've seen shortly after the attack, they arrested several dozen individuals, as the Islamic Republic always does after terror attacks, mm -hmm. never beforehand, always afterwards. They seem to know precisely who was involved. Mm -hmm. And this is part of this campaign to regain credibility internally, um, to say we are still a actual strong and powerful state and we can act similar to what the Americans can do. We can strike targets abroad at will. And Iran, when you think about it, it controls to varying degrees the major sources of violence that we're seeing right now in the Middle East. I'm thinking about the Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas, and now we're seeing attacks on three other countries, Pakistan being the, the latest. Taking all of this together, I mean, are we going to see a reaction um, being provoked here? And if so, from whom? We are in a very tense situation, and so far the Iranians have very skillfully managed, more skillfully than the internal security, they have skillfully managed their proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah, as well as the Houthis. Uh, really always tingering on the verge of regional conflict, but never yet crossing the, crossing the line, right? So uh, trying to get a role in all of this is really what Iran seems to want. If you're avoiding a wider regional conflict with attacks on Iran itself, while at the same time getting a seat at the table. There are negotiations with Arab countries, Egypt, with Qatar, with others, um, on the future of Gaza. The Iranians are nowhere to be seen. So they're trying to muscle their way back into this process. And do you think we're likely to see even more interference coming from Iran? I mean, is their goal to keep throwing something against the wall until it breaks? Absolutely. That's always been the I mean, strategy. That's what the axis of resistance is there for. Um, the ultimate uh, activation of Hezbollah will only come if there would be attacks on Iran itself. Um, but, you know, keeping the pressure high, uh, if you just look at the Houthi situation, there's really zero to gain for the Houthi movement in attacking these ships and quite a lot to lose. Yet they're still doing it, partially self-motivated, but also partially on behest of Iran, which wants to increase the pressure on Israel, on the international community. How concerned are you, Mr. Schindler, that the United States is going to, to have to get more involved militarily on this? I mean, I know some people's eyebrows were, were raised this week when we got news that a U.S. ship had been hit in the Gulf of Aden. I mean, I guess we're waiting for something for the next um, shoe to fall, if you will. I mean, how concerned are you? Yes, I mean, first of all, on the U.S. ship, zero damage was caused, right? So this was really more or less a, a Houthi dud. Yet they tried again. I'd like to point out that the veracity of the Houthi attacks has significantly reduced since the U.S. airstrikes, so something is working. But I doubt that the U.S. airstrikes and U.S.-U.K. airstrikes uh, those two days were sufficient enough to ultimately deter from the Houthis from trying. And as we had discussed on this program earlier, um, what we really need to do is to keep the Red Sea and the Gulf uh, and the Suez Canal open. Uh, Egypt has a 40% reduction in income in the Suez Canal. That's dramatic for the Egyptian budget, just at the moment where Egypt will play a key role 
in whatever happens in the future of Gaza. So this is not only a, a really tense region situation, it's also a mm. question of global supply chain and mm. uh, a global energy security uh, with the Brent continuing to rise. Mr. Let me ask you, before we run out of time, the world this week now talking more than ever about Donald Trump possibly becoming U.S. president yet again, that following, of course, the Iowa caucus. Uh, talk to me about how you see this anticipation of a second Trump presidency impacting what is going on right now in the Middle East. Is it going to make things more volatile or, I mean, is Trump also a, a leverage for more possible peace maneuvering? Well, at the moment, I would say, first of all, I would point out it's not a done deal that Donald Trump is going to be the next U.S. president. There is still President Biden who will run against him, most likely. Um, of course, in the next six months, this, the impact of this, potential, uh, of this potentiality of Trump becoming president is going to be rather weak. Um, once the proper election campaign has started and it's clear it's Trump against Biden, then, of course, everyone in the region will hedge their bets because it really is unclear who's going to be the next president. So at the moment, I cannot really see a direct impact here. But uh, election or not in America, mm. the question of what happens the day after in Gaza is a fundamental question. The mm. military operations in Gaza will only buy Israel time. Mm. Everything they destroy now can be rebuilt. If there is not a sustainable solution, if Hamas finances are not attacked globally, and that requires really global cooperation, if there is no sustainable, stable solution for Gaza once the military operations are over, all of this is just buying years, but not more, mm -hmm. before this is all being rebuilt, and whether it's calling itself Hamas or some other name, there will be a new extremist generation, because Hamas has made sure to train enough children to hate yeah. Israelis and Jews, to rebuild its structure sooner or later. Yeah, definitely. The cycle will be repeating itself. Hans Jakob Schindler, as always, Mr. Schindler, we appreciate your time and your analysis. Thank you.